Thank you, Pastor Donny, and uh, thank you, worship team, uh, for leading us into a time of uh, honoring God today. And uh, good morning to all of you. It's uh, good to be back in the house of the Lord. And uh, how are is everyone doing? Good. If you are doing good here in this hall, would you be like, Pastor Francis, give me a big thumbs up and uh, so I can see. Yes, it's good to see that. And for those of you who are joining us online as well, if you are doing good, would you give me a thumbs up emoji uh, or give me a wave in the chat section? And I trust that your families are doing well and uh, that God's peace will always surround and fill your homes and may you experience His joy each and every single day. You know, the other day, I was just uh, running around in my neighborhood and I counted that at least, uh, at a minimum, there's 20 houses that is doing some sort of a renovation. Whether is it renovating their front part of the house or whether is it renovating the back portion of their house. And uh, it tells me that people are a little bit hopeful for this year. You know, people are excited for this year. Maybe perhaps for the past couple of years, people have hold on uh, on renovating their house because, you know, finances are a little bit tight. But, you know, this year, you know, things are starting to pick up and people are a little bit more hopeful. And even we are in the midst of what we call a transitioning period to an endemic phase for our nation. You know, I think people are starting to look forward to 2022 uh, with hope and uh, with eyes wide open, and it really feels like a new season filled with new opportunities. And I uh, you know, speaking of new season, uh, Pastor Donnie's and uh, Pastor Angie's baby is due in a couple of days' time, and uh, we are excited for the Tan family. You know, one more addition to the family, uh, more Yit Lao, yeah, and uh, the more excitement in the home, more joy, more fun and laughter. And uh, so before this morning, before we look into the Word of God, uh, we're going to pray for the family. Uh, you know, even as they're anticipating uh, the arrival of the baby. And Pastor Donnie is behind there. And so can I just invite all of us to arise to our feet? And can we just stretch our hand uh, to Pastor Donnie, wherever he is, uh, right behind? Oh, he's coming to the front right now. Okay. Can we just stretch our hand towards him? And uh, he's going to stand in proxy for his family and all. And shall we just pray for him? And then we're going to pray for the service as well. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you uh, for the gift of life. We thank you for children. Indeed, children are blessing from you. And so, Father, this morning, we rejoice together with Pastor Donnie and Pastor Angeline, even as they are anticipating the arrival of their third baby. And Lord, we pray uh, for both the mother and child that on the day of arrival, that everything will be smooth. There will not be any complication, that it will be a smooth and quick delivery, Lord. And Lord, we also pray for Pastor Donnie, that God, even as he has to uh, take care of the other girls as well, Lord, we just ask for your hand to be upon him, for for your strength to be upon him, to sustain him, Lord. That even in this midst uh, of uh, anticipating of the new addition to the family, that God, there will be much joy in the house, there will be much laughter, there will be much uh, fun as well. So Lord, we ask that you will bless the Tan family. We ask that you would uh, pour out your favour upon their lives, Lord. And Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can gather uh, uh, these moments around your word. And Lord, we know that when we gather, that your Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. And so, Father, we commit the rest of this time to you. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and give us the mind to understand, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know, last Sunday, uh, I was having a conversation with my sons before bedtime, and uh, we were just done having a Bible story, and uh, you know, we were just chatting about what they had learned from the story. And my eldest son, uh, Dominic, Ask me an interesting question, or rather it was an astute observation on his part. And I actually had this conversation with him many times before this, and Dom brought up the question, how do I know God is speaking to me when I can't hear him speak? How do I know God is speaking to me when I can't hear him speak? And to be honest, I've been asked this important question uh, many times over by people way older than my son. You know, I've been asked by youths, young adults, and even older folks alike on this topic. How do I know God is speaking to me when I can't hear Him speak? It's a very deep question, but it's also a very revealing question of one's confidence and trust in the Lord. How do I know God is speaking to me when I can't hear him speak. 
And so since I've had this conversation with him many times before this, I asked him back the question, uh, do you remember the four general ways God speaks to us? And he said, mm, um, kind of. You know, God speaks to me through the Bible stories, you know, that we read. You know, God speaks to me through uh, mommy and daddy. Um, the other two, I can't really remember. And I told him, wow, very good, very good. You can remember at least these two things. Uh, these two ways God speaks to us. You know, yes, God speaks to us through people, but not just anyone, through godly people. Uh, yes, God definitely speaks to us through His Word, through the Bible stories that we read. And that is the primary way God speaks to us. And I went on to tell him, God speaks to us through the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Though we can get it mixed up a little bit uh, with other voices easily if we have not spent time recognizing His prompting and His leading in our lives. And of course, the final way that uh, I, I mentioned to him is that God speaks to us through the circumstances around us, through what's happening in our lives. And God gives us the wisdom to know His will and to know His purposes in the midst of our circumstances. And, and the conversation went on a little bit further with uh, Dominic. And, you know, we, I, we come back to the question, how uh, do we know God is still speaking to us when we can't hear Him? And I, we came to the answer, it is because of what we know of God through the Bible. The Bible shows us who God is. The Bible shows us His desires for us. The Bible shows us His plans and His purpose for our lives. And you know, you know so it may feel like God isn't speaking, but He really is. And we've got to learn how to listen to the four general ways uh, that He speaks to us. Of course, He does speak in many other ways, but these are the four general ways. And uh, we ended that conversation there uh, with my son, okay? And we'll probably pick it up on another time. And... Uh, if you think about it, it's actually quite a deep conversation before going to bed, right? And I don't know why we always do this. We always have these deep conversations uh, before going to bed. Uh, the boys definitely got uh, their astuteness for pillow talk from their mom. They did not get it from me. From me, if my head hit the pillow, I would sleep, okay? And uh, the next day, so anyway, the next day, I was just reflecting on my conversation uh, with my son and also of the many conversations that I had uh, with many of you who have had this question before. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit you know, prompting me and bringing me to my attention that this question will arise particularly when an individual goes through a season of silence coupled with life's challenges at hand. You know, when there's challenges in life mixed together with the feeling that God is silent, this question becomes a very weighty one. And yet, throughout the Bible, when we look at it from cover to cover, we see many individuals choosing to put their confidence in God even in the midst of their circumstances. You know, they have what I would call an even blank, even though blank, I will kind of faith. And that's my title for this morning. Even though blank, I will blank. Now, say for instance, in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 to 18, the author writes this, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Wow, what a faith. Even in the midst of scarcity, even in the midst of famine and barrenness, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. What a faith. How about another passage of Scripture? You know, say for instance in Daniel chapter 3. Now, this is the famous story of Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At the time, the king of Babylon made a decree that if anyone who doesn't bow down to the golden statue that he has built, they will be put to the fiery furnace and they will be burned to death. And obviously, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego adamantly refused to bow down to the statue. And here's their response to the king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. 
if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the ghost that you, you have set up. Even though I will. Even though I will. Whether they were rescued out of the fire or left to burn, they will stay true to God. No, what a faith. In the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were saved and they were obviously rescued uh, from the furnace. And there are many other examples like this throughout the Bible. You know, this kind of faith, we don't just see it happening in the two passages that we read this morning, but we see it being repeated over and over again in the Bible. Even though the individual may be going through a difficult situation, even though the circumstances doesn't look too good, they still choose to say, I will worship the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will bless the Lord. And no, church, this kind of faith, this kind of confidence comes from knowing God and not just head knowledge knowing, but knowing Him intimately. And know this morning, we are at the tail end of our Knowing God sermon series. And our Pastor Francis started us off with the fact that God desires to meet with us face to face. And our last week, Pastor Yiming showed us that our God is the Almighty God. And yet, He is so personal to each and every one of us. If you have missed any of the sermon, you can listen to the podcast wherever our podcasts are hosted. And today, as we bring this series to the land, we are going to discover a little bit more of who God is. And when we know who He is, I pray and I believe that each and every one of us here, we can have, no, 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 we will have this even though I will kind of faith. And at this morning, we're going to look at the life of Abraham. I know Abraham is uh, usually referred to as the father of faith. You know, whenever God speaks to the nation of Israel or introduces himself to his people, Abraham is actually one of the key persons mentioned. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. You know, Abraham is like the, the patriarch of the nation of Israel. You know, he is a very important guy. And we are introduced to him in the book of Genesis chapter 11. And we see his life played out all the way to Genesis chapter 25 when he drew his final breath. And throughout Genesis 11 to Genesis 25, we see Abraham's interaction with God. And now today, we won't have the time to go into details, that interaction. You can go back and read Genesis 11 to 25 on your own. But from a bird's eye view, as we observe Abraham's interaction with God, we would naturally think that the main character of the story would be Abraham. You know, after all, the entire Genesis 11 to 25 is dedicated to this person called Abraham. And just as how we were to read uh, First and Second Samuel, uh, we would think that the main character is either the prophet Samuel or King Saul or King David. But if we were to look at the Bible in its entirety, we can't help but realize that the main character is and always has been none other than God. It is about God. It is about Him revealing Himself to us through the various interactions that God has with the people that we find in the Bible. The Bible is about God. And the story of Abraham is no different from it. No, and the one thing I like about Abraham's interaction with God is that it shows us a journey of walking with the Lord. It's not just for a short time, but it is a journey of walking with with the Lord. It's almost a lifetime. And it paints for us a beautiful, beautiful picture of walking with God. And from Abraham's interaction with him, there are three things that God reveals himself to Abraham. And the first thing that God reveals himself to be is that God is the chief navigator. God is the chief navigator. He is the one who directs our paths. Now, oftentimes, we may equate God to being like a GPS. But no, God is not like our Waze app 
where we are the ones who key in the location and the app guides us along the way. You know, say for instance, if you want to go to Zoo Nagara, you key in the location Zoo Nagara in your Waze application and your Waze will guide you how to go. You know, go straight, turn left, turn right, you know, make a big round, you know, that kind of thing. But God is not like that. God is the one who keys in the location and He is the one who directs our steps towards it. And let's get this clear this morning. God is the one who determines the location and God is the one who directs our path. You know, oftentimes we ask God to bless the location of our choice. But no, that's not how it goes with God. God is the chief navigator in our lives. He determines where we go. He determines the steps that we take. You know, look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. God said to Abram, okay, this is his short form name before he changed it to Abraham. God said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot, which is his nephew, went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. God gave Abraham the directive which is to go from his home country. He didn't have a meeting with Abraham and have a consultation with Abraham. Okay? He didn't say, hey, Abraham, um, do you think you should stay in Haran or go from Haran? Come on. That did not happen. He did not consult Abraham on the plans. None whatsoever. No negotiation. Just a clear directive to go. God is the chief navigator. And the second thing that God reveals Himself in the, His interaction with Abraham is that God is the master chef. God is the master chef. Now, what is a master chef? In any restaurant, the master chef or the head chef is the one who determines the dish. Now, for instance, if I were to go to a Chinese restaurant and order their chiu pie, you know, their in-house specialty fried rice, okay? Uh, the master chef is the one who has already predetermined how that dish is going to look like, how it's going to taste, and he knows the necessary ingredients that are needed to produce that kind of result. And so in some sense, God is the master chef. No, we are the final dish that comes from Him and adding all the flavors into our lives. You know, through the various life experiences that we go through, through the many people that we encounter with in this life and even in the things that we do. God knows the intended final product and He brings in all the different flavors into our lives. And at the same time, because He gives us the free will of choice, we are able to bring in the different flavors based on, on our own choice and action. And yet, the final product is still in God's hand. God is still the one orchestrating it. Now, for those of you who know how to cook, you know there is more than one way to make any Chinese uh, vegetables salty, any stir-fried Chinese vegetables salty. You, know? you can either add salt, you can either add soy sauce, you can either add black bean sauce, oyster sauce, uh, you can add in some chicken stock, you can add in a meat that is salty, and you can do all kinds of things to achieve uh, the saltiness in the veggie, right? And there is more than one way to make the vegetable salty. And so likewise, God being the master chef knows how the final dish ought to taste and look. And He brings in the various flavours at the same time, giving us the free hand to add in the flavours ourselves. And when we deviate from the intended flavour, just like how any pro master chef in any restaurant who knows how to correct the dish, when uh, the dish has gone you know, off tangent a little bit, the, the pro master chef add in some uh, many other ingredients you know, to correct it. Likewise, God does the same for us. And it's just that it takes a little bit longer to arrive at the final dish. Abraham, yes, he was caught of God. But at the same time, Abraham was not without flaws. He made several blunders here and there in his interactions with people. He was not perfect, but Abraham trusted 
the one who is. He trusted the master chef to put the necessary ingredients in his life to shape him, to lead him, to mold him, to make him the person God is calling him to be. Abraham, uh, Hebrews, not Abraham, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 to 12, it says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so, from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. God is the master chef who in all things works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So God reveals Himself as the chief navigator. God reveals Himself as the master chef. And God, in His interactions with Abraham, reveals Himself as the constant one. God is the constant one. He is consistent. That's what constant means. Constant means the same, reliable, because there will be no change in it. It stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is the constant one. In His interactions with Abraham, God proved Himself over and over again that He is constant. From Genesis chapter 11 all the way to chapter 25, his message to Abraham was always the same. He spoke to Abraham many times about his call for him and about the promises that God has declared to Abraham. And it wasn't just mere words. God's actions towards Abraham and his hand on Abraham's life in shaping him, in molding him, has always been in line, in tangent with what he has spoken to Abraham about. Never once did God contradict himself. But perhaps for some of us, the idea that God is constant is far-fetched because we have not had the opportunity to experience such a thing. Our interaction, perhaps with one another, shows us that mankind is not constant. At times, perhaps we ourselves may not match up with what we say and do. Our lives, perhaps at times, may not be as consistent as we want it to be. But God is not like us. God is holy. And holy means He is perfect in every way. He is without blemish. He is without fault. He is complete, not lacking in anything. Holy means that He is righteous. He is just. He is merciful. He is constant. And so from Abraham's life, we know that God is the chief navigator. We know that God is the master chef. And we know that God is the constant one. And as we land this series of Knowing God this morning, I believe the question that we all ought to ask ourselves today is, how do we respond to God who desires to meet with us? How do we respond to God who is almighty and yet so personal to each and every one of us? How do we respond to God who is the chief navigator of our lives? How do we respond to the master chef who is also the constant one? We respond with an even though blank, I will kind of faith. Even though blank, I will blank kind of faith. And there are three things that we can learn from Abraham in his response to God, in his walking with God throughout his life. And as we go through these three things, I want all of us to picture ourselves in it. Now, each one of these three things starts with a phrase, even though blank. And you know, this morning, you fill up the blank with whatever that you are going through in your life right now. You think about it, you reflect on it, 
you write it down and you make it personal for yourself. And so the first thing that Abraham teaches all of us is that even though blank, I will believe in God. Even though blank, I will believe in God. You know, even though I'm going through a tough time at work, even though my business is struggling, even though I don't know what's ahead of me, whatever it is that you are going through right now in this season, you fill that up in that blank space. Even though blank, I will believe in God. Everybody say to me, belief. You know, Abraham, he had some doubts. He questioned and asked God, how is it possible that he's going to be a father of multitudes when he doesn't even have a single son? And this is what God's respond to him. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, God took Abraham outside and said to him, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then God said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham, even though at the time he didn't have a son yet, he trusted God. He chose to believe in God and because of his belief in God, God counted him as righteous. Now, this was actually a foreshadow of what it means to believe in Jesus. We know in the New Testament, it says this, for it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, not works, belief. In other words, when we say we believe in God here in this context, we are saying to God, God, you know, I may not understand what's happening. You know, God, I may not see the light at the end of the tunnel. God, I may be struggling in my relationship with my family members. But God, you are my salvation. God, you are my hope. God, you are my healer. God, you are my deliverer. God, you are my restorer. God, you are the one who has set me free. And I believe. I believe. You know, at times, church, the enemy wants to fill our minds, our thoughts with doubts. And when our minds, our thoughts are filled with doubts, we allow the enemy to rule over us and to cripple us. And the enemy knows this, and he is very quick to whisper doubts in our mind. Oh, my friend, you are stuck in this. Oh, there's no way out. Oh, the doctor's report is permanent. Oh, you are doomed. No one knows what you are going through. Friends, this is not how God intends for us to live. You know, church, when you and I come face to face with those moments of doubt and fear, and the reality is we will come face to face with them. We, there's no running away from them. But we always respond with faith. We respond with faith. We don't allow our thoughts to take us captive, but rather we take captive over every thought in Jesus' name. Let me say that again. We don't allow our thoughts to take us captive, but we take captive over every thought in Jesus' name. And perhaps, you know, this morning, maybe I need to put a caveat here. And uh, growing up as a second-generation Christian, I often had the impression that faith and doubt are at loggerheads with one another. You know, like one cannot have both at the same time. It's either or. It's either you have faith or you have doubt. No, you can't have both at the same time. But as I reflect on it further, I come to the realization that faith and doubts are present at the same time in almost every situation. It is possible to completely have one only unless you are superbly full of faith. And I would need to learn from you how you arrive at that, at that stage, you know. And the only clear distinction of a person who is full of faith than one who isn't, is that a person who is full of faith doesn't allow, doesn't give room for the doubt to linger any longer than it should. A person who is full of faith is quick to take captive every thought and bring it to submission to the Lordship of Christ. 
And that's what I love about Abraham. Even though he did not even have a biological son at the time, but because God said so, he chose to believe. Because God said so, so be it. And so this morning, can I encourage you, if you are in a season where you are faced with a situation, with doubts, with fears, with uncertainty, but at the same time, you know what God has spoken into your life, can I encourage you, be like Abraham. Because God said so, I believe. Because God said so, I choose to believe. And would you dare to take those thoughts, those doubts, and take it captive and bring it to the submission of Jesus. And so this morning, the first step, the first thing that Abraham teaches is that even though blank, whatever it is, I will believe in God. And the second thing that Abraham teaches us is this, even though blank, I will honour God. Even though blank, I will honour God. Abraham honoured God wherever he went. If you were to go back and look at Genesis 11, all the way to 25, you will notice a common recurrence. Whenever Abraham went, and wherever he go, and whoever, uh, the place that he comes to, and whenever God spoke to him, Abraham always built an altar before the Lord to worship Him, to honour Him. You know, perhaps in Abraham's mind, even though I'm in a foreign land, I will worship God. Even though I've yet to see the promise of a multitude of descendants, I will honour God. Even though blank, I will honour God. Everybody say to me, honour. And church, this morning, no, I believe the Holy Spirit is challenging each and every one of us today. And I believe the Holy Spirit is asking us, will we be a generation of people who learn to honour God even though when we are facing challenging times? Will we be a generation of people who knows how to honour God that our praise always precedes our prayer and petition before the Lord? Will we be a generation of people marked by our worship before the Lord even in the midst of our circumstances? That when other people look at us, they will say, hey, you look different. How can you be cheerful or joyful in the trials that you are going through? And we can answer that. It's because we have learned how to honour God in every situation. You know, one of the reasons why I love to do house dedication or office dedication, because it's a time of honouring God. I know that other religions, when they do house dedication or office dedication, you know, sometimes they call the feng shui master and uh, they, the feng shui master will come and put some mirror here, ask you to arrange certain things, you know, that kind of things. And they do it to what of evil spirits. Um, which, if you think about it, it's actually an irony because evil spirits cannot ward off evil spirits. Huh? In fact, they will have a big party and it will be more unsettling in that place. But anyway, for us as believers in Christ, whenever we do house dedication or office dedication, we do it to honour God. We are saying to God, you know, God, I honour you with this house that you have given me. I honour you with this, in this office that you have placed under my care. May you take preeminence in this place. May you be magnified. May you be glorified in all that happens in this space, in this house or in this office. And church, that's honouring God. When we acknowledge His Lordship in our lives. And when we honour God, it is not by paying lip service to God when we gather here on Sundays. No, no, no but it's seen in our walk with Him every other day in our lives. When we honour God, I believe that we know and we know and we can know that His presence goes before us. And when God's presence goes before us, friends, we don't have to ward off any evil spirits. Evil spirits will have to flee in the presence of a holy God. Live a lifestyle of honouring God. And when we learn to lift the name of Jesus high in our lives, come on, darkness will have to flee. So number two, Abraham teaches this. Even though blank, whatever that you're going through right now, 
I will honour God. And the last but not least, the third thing that Abraham teaches us this morning, even as we're going to come to a close today, is that even though blank, I will surrender everything to Him. I will surrender everything to Him. Abraham did not withhold anything from God. He surrendered everything to Him, including his son, whom God has said that a multitude of descendants would come from. You know, the Bible tells us that one fine day, God spoke to Abraham and asked him to go to a place called Mount Moriah and bring his son along there to sacrifice him. Abraham trusted that God knew what he was doing and obeyed all the way to the point of even taking the knife and he was just about to strike down his son when the angel of the Lord stopped him right there and then. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19 tells us this, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Even though blank, I will surrender everything to him. Everybody say with me, surrender. Now, even though Abraham did not understand God's instructions, he chose to surrender everything to God. Even though it may seem easier to do things our own way, let us choose to surrender everything to God. Even though at times we may feel like we are in the dark and not knowing which step to take, let us determine and say in our hearts, I will surrender everything to Him. Now, even though God seems far away, I will surrender everything to Him. Even though the year ahead seems to be filled with many battles, I will surrender everything to Him. Now, perhaps for those of you who are joining us online, you may be thinking, hey, even though I may be unwell in the body, I will surrender everything to Him. And know this morning, even as the worship team comes and leads us in the last song that we have sang earlier on, you know, I'm reminded some months back of a, cons- of a conversation that I had with a member. And I remember that it was, a, it was a, on a Friday. It was on Friday. And I received a text from the member and requesting for prayers. And uh, basically, uh, a member in her family uh, was having trouble sleeping. The member was, has been hearing noises at night, even though uh, the, the church member itself could not hear. And if I can be honest with you, at that time when I received a text, if, I would, if there was a scale level for faith, you know, zero being uh, no, uh, very low faith, 10 being, wow, you have a faith uh, you know, so big that you can tell the mountain to move and the mountain will move, I would say my, my level on the scale would be probably a negative 10, okay? Because I was going through uh, certain things, you know, I had a lot of questions, you know, and, and I was struggling a little bit in my faith. And, and when I received the text, I was one asking myself, or, or rather asking God, God, how am I going to reply to this person? How am I going to pray for this individual? And the Holy Spirit prompted me and brought me to this passage in Mark chapter 9. At the time, there was a man who brought his son who was possessed to Jesus. And the, 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 the son had a mute and deaf spirit. And whenever he had seizures, the spirit would throw the boy to the ground and he would foam in the mouth. And uh, the, here's the conversation Jesus has with the boy's father in Matthew chapter 9, 21 to 24. It says this, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And the boy's father replied, from childhood, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. And, the, and here's what the boy's father asked Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on him, take pity on us and help us. You know, the boy's father had a big, le- a big level of doubt. 
no but. No, if you can do anything. No, just if lah, huh? Just if. Not, not even certain. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus, I, I, I think he was a bit flabbergasted. He said, if you can, serious? Are you kidding me? I've healed so many people. I've, I've healed them. I've raised them up. If you can, here's what Jesus said. Everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And at that moment, as I was going to reply in the text, you know, with a short prayer, these three things that we have gone through, the life of Abraham, I straight away, I said, God, I choose to believe. Even though what I'm going through right now is not really encouraging, I have a lot of questions, I choose to believe. Even though I may not see the answers, but I choose to honour you, Lord. Even though things are uncertain, I choose to surrender. I choose to surrender. And, and just like the boy's father, I said, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. And I straight away, okay, type that, that a prayer, quick prayer, and send. And uh, both, both myself and the member, we said, Amen, and then uh, that's it. And you know, for the next uh, couple of days, we, I didn't hear anything from the member. So I thought, oh, okay lah. Maybe my level of doubt is just too great. Lah, huh? my, my faith too small, tablet pakai, you know, that kind of thing. I was just thinking to myself, oh, this is a lesson for me to learn. You know? Before prayer, I need to have big, big faith, you know, that kind of thing. And then, come Monday, I received a text from the member. And the member said, oh, uh, sorry, Pastor, lah, I didn't get the opportunity to reply you over the past few days because I'm very busy. But just to let you know, uh, my family member uh, slept peacefully for the, the whole weekend ever since you prayed that prayer. And then, then, it was like a slap in my face. Uh, see lah, see, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it's good enough. And I think it serves as a reminder for each and every one of us here. You no, know, whatever that we are going through in life today, in your season, be like the boy's father. and says, Lord, I believe. And yes, I have my doubts. Yes, I have my uncertainties. Yes, I have my questions. But Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. And church, this morning, even as we have sang the song earlier on, and we have declared that God's Word is unshakable, His promises stand. And because His Word never changes, we know that what the Bible says about who God is, is true. That God is the chief navigator. That God is the master chef. That God is the constant one. And that's why you and I, we can respond with an even though I will kind of faith. And so this morning, whatever you are going through right now, in your season, even as we sing this song, can I encourage you, would you dare to say to the Lord, God, even though whatever it is that you're going through, I will believe in God. I will honour you. I will surrender everything to you.